Hey everybody, thank you very much for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Dr. Kailash Sahu, who is an uh, uh, astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, where he's been since 1995. So Kailash has had a long and distinguished career in observational astronomy since getting his PhD from the Physical Research Laboratory of India in 1985. Um, he is uh, currently here on sabbatical at the IAS and will be here all year. He is primarily interested these days in microlensing, although he's worked on many other things, including gamma ray bursts and uh, stellar populations in the galactic bulb. But these days he's using microlensing as a tool to do pretty much everything, to detect planets and black holes and stars and measure the mass of white dwarfs. Um, he's also doing us an enormous favor because, uh, as you know, Professor Samaya Nasanki was supposed to be here this week. Unfortunately, she was on to travel, so Kailash agreed to step in with just one week's notice and put together a global conference. So we are eternally grateful for him, to him for that. And we're very excited to hear about these excellent results on detection of an isolated black hole and the mass measurements of white dwarfs through astrometric microlensing. So please welcome Kailash Sahu. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Uh, um, Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm honored to, to be uh, able to give a talk here at uh, uh, the Institute of Advanced Study, where uh, Einstein worked and laid the foundation of much of the work that I am going to talk today about. So, uh, so I, here, uh, actually, I will talk uh, first. Uh, I've decided to talk first about the mass measurements of isolated white dwarfs. Uh, and then talk about the detection of uh, and mass measurement of the isolated black hole for two reasons. First, the, the mass measurement part, that's actually a direct extension of the experiment that confirmed Einstein's relative theory of relativity. Uh, so I don't want to skip that. If I start talking about the detection of isolated black hole, I will probably have no time. So, so I thought I would like to first talk about this and then go to the so, um, okay. uh, oh, there is a bit of a delay, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> so Einstein um, postulated the theory of relativity in 1915, which was experimentally verified through, by uh, Eddington by observing the deflection of starlight during this solar eclipse in 1990. This, um, oh, this time gap. Um, uh, so this was declared by New York Times as one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest of achievements in the history of human thought. Uh, that, uh, that put general relativity on a solid footing and my, uh, made Einstein an international celebrity. Now, uh, the gravitational bending, now it's 100 years later, uh, the gravitational bending, of course, can be used now to, to measure the mass of a star. Um, the, um, the mass of a star is arguably the most important physical parameter of a star. The mass of the star determines how long it's going to live, what its radius is, and uh, the composition, the, uh, the lifetime, the radius, the mass, the luminosity, everything is pretty much dependent on the mass. Yet, we astronomers don't actually have a direct method to measure the mass of a star. It's usually uh, based on models, or if there is a binary, then we can determine its, its mass. So here is one method which can actually, you can use if you can, Determine the bend, how much the it bends of the light of a background star. You can measure the mass of the star. Mm. So, okay, talk about that. So, oh, so, but the deflections. If you want to measure the deflections, they are extremely tiny. 
about thousand times. The, the previous slide, the, the confirmation of relativity, the, during the solar eclipse, the star was deflected by about 1.75 arc seconds. Here, it will be thou about thousand times smaller. So to give you an idea of what uh, the deflection is going to be, let me see. Uh, The, the deflection from a star is expected to be about one milliarc second, okay? So to give you an idea of what a milliarc second is, here is a US quarter. So the US quarter, guess how far I have to put this US quarter so that it subtends an angle of one milliarc second, okay? So I put in the end of the room, end of the campus, end of Princeton, 10 miles away, 20 miles away, 100 miles away, how far? So let's take a look at the big time gap. <laughs> so here is a, uh, the map of the United States. So. So here is a US quarter. Let's see how far we have to move. If we are in Princeton, the US quarter has to be all the way in San Francisco so that the US quarter subtends an angle of one milliard seconds. So this is, has a diameter of about an inch, 0 0.96 inch. So you can calculate that if you have to be all the way there. So the measurement, if you imagine if there is a little ant in San Francisco in the US quarter, which moves from one end to the other. And from here, we have to measure that angle. So that's, the, that's how difficult it is. But with Hubble Space Telescope, it's possible. Um, that has been demonstrated. So we started a project uh, to look for such microlensing events such, uh, by stars. So the best ones would be if there are nearby the high proper motion ones, then they can come in front of a background star and they will cause this deflection. So we started a long time ago uh, to look for such microlensing events. When I was looking for, when I was trying to do this, uh, there was one when a bright young student from Hungary uh, came joined me as a summer intern and he, name is Gaspar Bakos, who happens to be here. Uh, so he, he joined me uh, and then we looked so um, we, the one problem with this, the, we wanted to project all the high proper motion stars to look for the, such events. But one problem was the, all the uh, coordinates we had only up to about one arc minute. In RA, it had only uh, seconds, no decimal of the seconds. And in minutes, it had only decimal minutes, no arc seconds. So that was, of course, very difficult. So, so Gaspar took up this project to actually update all the entire 5,000 star catalog, um, the catalog by comparing the, the DSS images of the first one and the second uh, epoch and updated the, uh, the catalog, which, was, which we used. Um, maybe I should embarrass a bit more when I tell you. So the, uh, the, so in fact, he first came, the, when he came, uh, the next day, I asked him, uh, I told him three different projects and to choose, okay, choose which one you want to do. Um, uh, think about this and the next day. So the next day he comes and says, he would like to do all the three projects. So anyway, <laughs> it's, I, I won't go into more that details. <laughs> So one particularly interesting event is uh, by Stein 2051b. Why is it interesting? So particularly, I was interested in getting the mass of white dwarfs. The, you know, of course, the, you know that all the stars with mass less than 10 solar mass, they end their life as black holes. And the existence of this mass radius relationship. So, um, so here is the, the mass radius. There is a, uh, the mass radius relationship uh, comes directly from fundamental theory and the available data 
they have were all over the place. They were kind of consistent, but, but no clear um, indication here. So we thought the one way to measure that, you know, and, and there were three uh, white dwarfs for which the masses have been de determined directly from, uh, from, uh, from binary. And though they were, they fell in this line, but on the other hand, whether there is a um, relation, whether there is a change because they are a part of the binary, that was not clear. So we wanted to observe this. So honor is yeah, where did the other masses on that type table come from? Uh, the other ones from the, the models. So the you know the uh, not directly from the mass radius relationship itself, but there are I don't know the, all the details, but uh, uh, there are various other models do which they go and then put on you know, the mass radius relationship. Uh, uh, not directly from the mass radius. Otherwise, of course, they would fall from that. So this is uh, the Stein 2051 system where um, the, um, this is also part of a binary, but the separation is pretty large, about 55 astronomical units, uh, so that it is unlikely to have been affected by the companion itself. So here is a, a simulation how what happen if there is a the background star, if the white dwarf passes by, then what happens to the background star? If the, as it passes by, you're expected, this will be expected to be make a loop if we want to observe. Uh, so here is the, uh, the actual HST observations. The first observation we took in 2013, and once we know the position, then of course we put the um, proper motion and the parallax, and we see that the, it would pass this way. Um, the background source is here, and then we observe at eight different epochs. Um, and the eight different epochs are shown here. So, by the way, most people probably have you know you know that parallax should happen. The, uh, but here is one where you would see, actually directly see, observe the, so here is what you would expect, the, the path of the white dwarf, which includes the proper motion and the parallax, and here are how it moves. So the, these are the predicted position and the actual observation. This is the actual observation of the position. So we used that to, um, to, to measure. So it, this is a very difficult project, not just because the deflections are small, but also because the white dwarf is about 400 times brighter than the source. The source here is somewhere here. The source is somewhere here, and the entire the, is dominated by the white dwarf itself. And you have to measure the position of the, of the source to 100 of a pixel accuracy. So of course, we had the necessary expertise that. So here, if you see, if you subtract the PSF, so here, um, sorry, big time lag between what I see here and what I see there. So Here you see the, uh, the what is observed here, and then at uh, the source that you see at this location. And once you subtract out the, sub, the white dwarf, the source is very clear. And then after the subtraction, we measure the position of that source. And see here is the actual measurements. Mm -hmm. So here, there are four epochs where the measurement of deflections are pretty clear. Um, so here, for example, the original position, but the deflection positions are, deflected positions are here, here the original position, but the, deflect, the measured positions are here. Uh, so this is shown in the next plot in X, Y deflections. So this is the model and in both in X and Y, and that model suggests that the Einstein ring radius is about 31 milliard seconds. 
which corresponds to a mass of 6, 0 0.675 plus minus 0 0.251. And once you put in the, uh, in the, the mass radius relationship theory, it is exactly false, exactly on the mass radius relationship that we would expect. So it provides a confirmation of the Voidberg evolutionary theory. This, um, this got a lot of attention now. So this was actually in 2017 in Discover Magazine uh, rated it as one of the top 100 science stories of 2000. I like the way they start. They say, three years ago, astronomers put a white dwarf on a scale and watched the needle move. It was funny. Uh, anyway. So after that, we, uh, there is another one, you know, white dwarf. The Lord 37, this, uh, the closest approach happened in 2019, exactly one century after the uh, experiment, uh, the solar experiment. So here are again the similar, the epoch one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and epoch two observed. Um, these are the position of the white dwarf as it passes by, and these are the points that we, we, we observe. And the source itself is here. And as it passes by, it causes a deflection of this short star. So the deflections at the epoch one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine are same here, and this is the model. So this again, uh, the mass is 0.56 uh, solar mass, and the mass radius relationship is here, right on the. Uh, now we have some few more. The, the next one, we are observing the white dwarf through JWST. The uh, good thing, the one major improvement with JWST is that here, we don't have to deal with the very bright neighbor. The very bright neighbor, here there is no um, uh, PSF bleeding onto the source star itself. So that means we should be able to measure it much better and the accuracy should be much better here. Uh, the expected accuracy is better than about uh, 2%. Because you're working at infrared? Because in the infrared. And also the infrared, infrared detector itself, you would not bleed, you would just make a hole on that same pixel itself, not, uh, not bleeding onto the Time used in gravity. Um, okay. Now I want to move to the isolated stellar mass black hole. Okay, good. Uh, so, to give you a little bit of introduction, all the stars which have mass more than 20 solar mass, they are expected to end their life as black holes. Oh, that is what is shown here in the, um, here the, uh, the initial final mass relationship. Now, if you, people have tried to calculate all the, you know, you take all the mass of stars with more than 20 solar mass and how many black holes there should be. And there are various estimates. They all agree that there should be about 10 to the power eight, about 100 million black holes in the galaxy. Now, 100 million black holes is a big number. I mean, to give you a perspective of how 100 million is, if you put 100 million black holes in the sky, say uniformly, then behind the sun or behind the moon, yeah, there should be about 600 black holes. Okay? So there are yet, and out of these 100 million black holes, a large fraction of these black holes should be just single because in these massive stars, about 30% of the stars are already to start with single. So they will end up of course as single. And of the remaining 70%, if they're very close by, let's say um, 
very close contact binaries, in which case they will be merged. They will merge at the late stages. So the, causing again a uh, single black hole. And if they are very wide, then the kick velocity may cause an orbital separation, which will again uh, cause a single black hole. So there should be a large fraction of these 100 million black holes which should be single. And yet not a single such isolated black hole had ever been detected. Of course, because they don't emit light, but maybe, but <clears throat> so the, um, so all the black hole detections so far are in binaries. Most of them, of course, are through X-rays. They about there have been about twenty or two dozen or so mm, such black holes have detected in our galaxy, and um, then they are confirmed through radial velocity, which gives the mass. Then few have been recently detected through radial velocity measurements, uh, uh, not through X-ray, and of course the closest black hole so far was recently detected through um, astrometry and velocity follow up by um, and uh, of course there have been black holes a lot of black holes have been detected by LIGO those are again um, in binaries The, now, the velocity Now, um, the masses of these black holes in our in the binaries, the all the you know the X-ray binaries and um, and the ones that are uh, through astrometry and all the masses of those are between three and twenty solar mass. The theoretical models they predict the masses to be anywhere between three and eighty solar mass, and the black black holes detected by LIGO they have mass range of up to five to about one hundred fifty solar mass. So there is some there seems to be some discrepancy between what you, in the binaries, what the theoretical models predict, and what the LIGO observations say. So observe ma the masses of black holes, of course, in, in, are in binaries and they have their own biases. And so a mass determination of a few isolated black holes will provide perhaps some in, important insights. So we have an HST program, which is designed to detect isolated black holes and measure their masses uh, and velocity. Then, um, the, regarding the velocity, so the theoretical models also have a lot of uncertainty what the velocities of the black hole should be. So there are models which say that if the remnant is, is massive, then the then it will end up with a higher velocity, uh, the higher velocity, the higher kick velocity, higher the mass, higher the kick velocity. There are some other theories which say that the, no, the the final momentum of the of the remnant is actually independent of the mass, so which would imply that the higher mass would have smaller velocity. Then there are others which say no, the the lower mass ones actually have more asymmetric explosion, so that means the lower ones would have much higher velocity. Uh, so there are different scenarios, uh, it's, and it would be good to good check which, which theoretical model is correct. So the microlensing is the only technique which is capable of actually detecting isolated black holes. Uh, they will not only be able to detect isolated black holes, but we can also measure their masses, distances, and velocities. So now I want to give a little bit of introduction on to the microlensing itself. Um, so microlensing, the idea of microlensing is not new. So in 1801, Soldner said that the foreground star will bend the light of a background star, but that's of course 
based on Newtonian theory, so the deflections were off by a factor of two. Uh, in the real insight into microlensing came out came from Einstein's paper in 1936. Uh, this paper, which he published in Science in 1936, this is my by far the most favorite paper of mine. This is just one um, page paper where he starts by saying, some time ago, R. W. Mandrew paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation which I had done at his request. This, this note complies with his wish. And then he starts. Uh, so, and this is the foundation of microlensing. Then I want to continue with a little bit of more about this historical perspective. <clears throat> so after the paper was accepted in science, Einstein wrote more frankly to the editor. He says, let me also thank you for your cooperation with the little publication which Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me. It is of little value, but it makes the poor guy happy. <laughs> So this was the basic, the basic theory of lensing was developed by Einstein uh, in 1912, before he completed the, before he actually published this, he had already done this in 1912. So, um, and in this paper, he says, I want, since this is, you know, Einstein work, I'm spending a bit more time on it. So, um, so he says, in this paper, 1936 paper, he says, of course, there is no hope of observing this phenomenon directly. First, we shall scarcely ever approach closely enough to such a central line. Second, the angle beta will defy the resolving power of our instruments. So he pretty much gave up that this would be never be observed. But in spite of that, actually in 1979, there was no, uh, the, it was experimentally confirmed by uh, the, the lensing. So to give you a quick introduction on microlensing, just three minute uh, tutorial on microlensing. So here, um, here is one, um, it's running here already, but so here is one, the, so here is the lens. This is the, the red is the lens, which is in front. So this is the Einstein ring around the lens. And imagine there is a source, the green is the source which it passes within this Einstein ring. As it passes through the Einstein ring, it splits up into two images, which are shown in blue. So these are the two images. Uh, so what is to be noted here is that the, the one outside the Einstein ring is always the brighter image. The one inside the Einstein ring, there is always one outside, one inside. One inside is the fainter image. At any given time, the lens, the source, and the two images are in a straight line. And the, the, the lensing preserves the surface brightness. So that means the area, the combined area of these two divided by the original area gives you the amplification. So this light amplification is shown here. So this is um, now. Uh, so this is um, one shot, this is shown here. Um, <clears throat> now, um, so this, uh, so since there have been several uh, microlensing survey programs, MOA, Ogle in particular, they have been monitoring uh, millions of stars towards the galactic bulge and large magnetic cloud to look for microlensing events. They have detected so far 30,000 microlensing events. So 30,000, of course, microlensing can be caused by anything, caused by star, neutron star, white dwarf, black hole, planet, everything. So, so if there are black holes, then out of these 30,000 events, some of them must be due to black holes. Now, problem is how do we know which one is a black hole? And that's the, uh, that's the problem. So what, we, the, what happens in, um, when you observe a microlensing event, they, when MOA and they, they observe a microlensing event, all that they see is this amplification of light curve. So this the light curve is all they, they see. 
And this light curve has only a one single useful parameter, and that is a time scale. Okay? The, the, combine, the combination of amplification and time scale gives you the time that it takes to cross the Einstein beam. Now, the mass of a of lens that depends on four different things. It depends on the time scale, it depends on the velocity, it depends on the distance to the source, and it depends on the distance to the lens. So the mass of the lens depends on four different things here, out of which what you have from the light curve is a single one TE. So there is a lot of degeneracy here. Yet, statistically, you would expect the mass of the lens to be higher if the time scale is larger. So people have taken the long time scale events and claimed to be those to be caused by black holes. If they don't see light, then it's caused by black holes. So there have been several claims uh, where the long duration microlensing events have been claimed to be as due to black holes. But the problem is that's not a def that's only a statistical one. You uh, you can never say whether it could be because of a of a low mass star which moves slowly. If, if a low, low mass star moves slowly, that can also cause this long time scale. So how do we distinguish between the low mass and the high mass? That then where the astrometry comes in. So the astrometry um, again, I want to give you a quick. Um, uh, Introduction to astrometric microlens. Now, so let's see here. This is the lens, and again, here is the um, the red dot is the source which passes through uh, the red open circle is the one that passes through the Einstein, uh, the Einstein. and it, at any given time it now causes two images, the two blue images. Since the one outside is brighter then the image, there will be a shift of the, of the centroid of, of the source star, which is shown by the red solid dot. So if you want to do measure the, uh, the astrometric shift, then you need to measure how far the red dot is shifted with respect to the, to the, uh, to the open circle. So it's a very hard project, but with HST, um, it's possible to do that. So to continue with the theory a bit, so how does astrometry help in determining the mass? Now, if you observe the, the light curve, the amplification at any given point is given by U, the lens source separation in units of Einstein ring width. So the amplification is a pure function of U, okay? So if you have an amplification, you know what U is. Now, the astrometric shift is delta is a function of u and theta e. Okay? So since you know u e from amplification, if you can observe the amplification and astrometric shift, that gives you directly the, the, the theta e. Okay? So the astrometric shift now tells you the angular Einstein ring radius, theta e. Now, the angular Einstein ring radius is the the, is given by Re, the linear one divided by dl, and, the, and that depends on three things, the mass, the distance to the lens, and the distance to the source. Okay? So we have got rid of the velocity here. The velocity is the big factor where you know the, the lens could be moving slowly or, or, or fast, we never know. That can be, be a huge factor. So here we got rid of the, the velocity. So that it now depends on three things, mass, the distance to the lens, and distance to the source. So astrometric shift now provides the measurement of the mass as a function of distances. Can we measure, so here, can we measure the distances? If we can measure the astrometric shift and the distances, we get the mass. So here, the once that are caused by the, the microlensing events caused by black holes, the massive objects, they are expected to be long duration. That means during that time, it can take about a year, during that time, Earth moves around the sun, which causes a slight wobble on the microlensing light curve itself. And that has been seen in many cases. So this wobble, this would be seen. And so if, and that's measurable. So if you can 
uh, if you have enough points in the microlens in light of the photometry measurements, then you get the parallax. So the parallax distance you get. And then if you, um, sorry, swap now here, okay. Um, then the distance to the source, well, usually if you are monitoring towards the bulbs, then the source is usually in the bulbs. But you can also put in the color magnitude diagram where the, you know, can confirm that it is indeed in the bulb, in the bulbs or not. Uh, so here, this is the bulb sequence, for example, here you have the uh, objects, if they fall in this, this is the bulb. But you can also, if you can have spectroscopy, then that even gives you a better estimate of the, of the distance. So, so you can measure the distance to the lens through parallax, distance to the source through CMD or through spectroscopy. Now, if you measure the, uh, the astrometric shift, now it gives you theta E. Since you measured this, now that gives you the mass. <clears throat> so, um, what I did, if you're careful, what we used here is just the, the astrometry. We did not use the time scale at all to measure the mass. So, in, they told you the photometry, there is only single parameter, the time scale. And we did not use the time scale here to actually get the mass of the, of the lens. So since we know the time scale, and now we know now the mass, the distances, and we know the size of the Einstein ring, the time scale now tells you that the mass. So this is a method which tells you the mass from the astrometry, the distance from the parallax, and the velocity from the time scale. So this is one method which you can use if you get the astrometry, you can measure the mass, distance, and the velocity from a single technique, unambiguously. There is no statistical uh, approach. So, so the method is pretty simple, right? So, um, so, we, so we, what we need to observe is we observe the potential black holes, which would be most likely the ones that time scale, if it is larger, then you would expect the uh, mass to be higher. And if there is no blending, then it is likely caused by a, something which does not emit light, so it may be a black hole. So we measure microlensing events, long duration events with no blending, and they measure their astrometric deflections. And then we can get the mass to the velocity. Uh, conceptually, it's very simple, but it's actually pretty tough. Um, so we started a project in, 19, um, in 2009. We started a program to observe such events uh, to measure their relativistic deflections. Um, these are long duration events. So that means we need to observe with HST for at least five years, at least five years, longer, most often longer, longer because we need the, you know, the astrometric shift falls off very slowly. Um, so to observe less time. Uh, and the deflections are, of course, pretty small, one to two milli arc seconds. Uh, and we have monitored eight events so far. What I'm going to talk now about is the first one that, um, that clearly showed that it's to be a black hole. I hope I have given enough introduction. Let's see to that. <clears throat> so this is um, the first event. Uh, the, MOA 2011 it was it was discovered by two groups, MOA and OGO. Uh, and this is a very high amplification event, uh, amplification of about 400. The time scale is about 270 days. Um, so as soon as I saw that, I thought this is a very potentially very strong candidate. But the one problem was that this showed very strong blending, you know, very strong blending. Observation. Uh, now, I have been working on microlensing for some time by then, and I knew that a lot of the times what happens is uh, the ground-based observations, there is sometimes a, a unrelated close-by star which causes this blending. So I thought, okay, we'll take a chance and, and see what, whether there is a, a, whether this blending is due to actually a, a something lens or not. So here, the next is the actual observation. Uh, yeah, now here. Okay, so the first one here, this is the, um, the source, which is, which is here magnified by about 12. 
And indeed, there is another very bright star. star. The, this is about 20 times brighter than the source at its baseline. The baseline is much here, so that the, the nearby blend is 20 times brighter. So here, um, so the, the blending that was caused, that was causing the, the, the ground based observations were because of this unrelated star. Uh, so we observed this at, at eight different epochs from 2011 to 2017. Um, and uh, the blending, as I said, is unrelated to the, to the source itself. Uh, this, so this is actually the, the nearby star. The source, our source is here. Uh, so the source uh, lies here. Um, at the so the point spread function of the nearby star, it pretty much covers the location of the source itself. So it's very important if you want to measure it very accurately. It's very important to subtract the contribution of this background star uh, to measure it accurately. Uh, so this was actually very crucial, and not only it was crucial to but also it was crucial to take into account the time dependent uh, variation of the, of the PSR. Uh, so we saw that from, from orbit, from exposure to exposure, the PSF varies. So that means we had to take from each exposure, you know, we have in each exposure, we have thousands of other stars. So we constructed PSFs from each exposure and as suitable for that particular exposure and we subtracted. I'm say, telling all this uh, in more great detail because um, there was another, I will tell a little more in detail later. Uh, there was another group who also, um, HST data become public just after one year. So another group also did the same measurements, but they did not take the PSF variation into account. In fact, they used the same, the, to measure the, uh, the astrometry, they used the, our algorithm but did not take the, the PSFs correctly. They did not subtract the PSF and also did not take the PSF variation into account. So that caused a lot of problems, which I will briefly touch on later on. So, uh, so it's very important to subtract the PSF to, uh, to measure. Okay. So, uh, so here is the, uh, after the subtraction, you see the, um, this is our source, the the PSF is subtracted the, after the subtraction, we made sure that the, the, at the location of the source, this is pretty clean, that is the subtraction is clean, not at the location of the, of the sphere itself, but at the location of the source, the subtraction is, is, is clean. We use that to measure the positions. So here is the light curve uh, of HST light curve, both in V and in I, they're pretty much achromatic, uh, this tells you that the blending cannot be more than 0 0.02 magnitudes. That provides a constraint of the blending to be less than uh, 0.02. Now, um, so here is the, the actual measurement. So the undeflected source, the source has a large proper motion. The undeflected source, the, the proper motion of the source is shown by this uh, black line. And what we observe is this deflected source position here, which are shown here. And of course, that any given time, the deflection is along the line joining the source and the lens. So we can tell where the lens is. So the lens has moved from here to here to here to here. To here. So that this is the path of the lens, which includes the path of the lens, includes the parallax itself. Um, and the, this is the the undeflected position, positions of the source and the green is the deflected position. Now, once you subtract, uh, okay. so here is the actual deflections. Now, um, I mean, I can't go into all the details, but here, Theoretically, you, what you would expect is, so here, let's say the source is at zero, zero. As the lens moves, then the source would, the deflection would be along the line joining the source and the lens. 
So if the lens moves this way, the deflections would be all in the opposite direction. Okay. So here is the deflection, the, the total deflection. Once you have the total deflection, then you can split that up into, you know, put an angle so that the X and Y ratio tells you the direction of motion of the lens. So this, you know, this is a very crude way of just determining where the, it, the direction of the lens and this itself, you know, it took me maybe 10, 15 minutes to figure out what the directions would be and it falls in, in this direction. So, and then of course we made it much more sophisticated, the combined analysis and all that. And if once we do that, then here is the, so here is the, after the uh, proper motion subtracted, the, here are the X deflections, the Y deflections, here, what I'm showing you is the, um, the combined fit to the astrometry and all the um, photometry observed by 14 different telescopes. Um, and so this is the, the fit, the Y deflection and the X deflection. The fit is beautiful. They pretty much fall within one sigma of most of these points. Uh, so this, this the model was beautiful. And this tells you that the theta E is about 5.18 milliard seconds. And the parallax from, from this combined fit, the parallax is 0.089, which corresponds to a distance of 1.58. So once you know the distance, the distance of 1.58 kiloparsecs, you know the theta E of 5.18, that tells you the mass to be 7.16. And, um, and since you know the time scale, uh, the time scale tells you that the, the velocity, the transverse velocity with respect to the source is 45 kilometers per second. So we have determined, we have detected something which, ha, which is at a 1.58 kiloparsecs, has a mass of 7.1 solar mass and moving at 45 kilometers per second. Now, <clears throat> this is coming up. Okay. So can this be a binary? First, let's say, but there, could this be a binary? So this, uh, I didn't talk much about the, this light curve. Uh, so I've been in this, you know, the, we try to detect you know, planets through the microlens and light curve. When you have a high amplification uh, microlens event, then it is very sensitive to detecting planets at the peak, closer to the peak. So if they, it has a planet, then you easily see the, the, the signature of the planet around the peak. So since it is a high amplification event, this was measured, this was intensely monitored by 14 different telescopes, all, all these telescopes closer to the peak, um, and no planet was found, but this was very useful in telling whether there is a companion to the lens. So we did the modeling all that, and this uh, light curve modeling suggests that there cannot be any companion more massive than about 10% of the lens mass within 238. So there is no, it's a clean single object. Now, what is, what is it? Um, so could it be a star, for example? Well, so if, you know, we observe this, the, uh, the source, and we know the, the lens was here and it's how far it's moving. In seven years, the lens would move by about 40 milliard seconds. So by 40 milliard seconds, it moves, then it would be, if it is, has any luminosity, it would be actually seen. So we did uh, some simulations. And here, if we put a 0.2 solar mass uh, star, then it would be visible. So there is, this is a, this is an object, seven solar mass object, which is not a binary, wh whose luminosity is less than that of a 0.2 solar mass. Object. Clearly, this is a 0.2 solar uh, black hole. So this is the this is the black hole uh, which moves 45 kilometers. Sorry. So then here is the Gaia uh, proper motions of all the stars at 1.6 kiloparsecs, and the velocity of the black hole is, is here. Uh, so this is clearly off uh, compared to pretty much all of the other stars. So this suggests that it's it moves uh, by about 45 kilometers with respect to the mean, uh, which may suggest that it got probably got a kick 
are doing the super max loop. So um, I already talked, uh, since I don't have much time, there's another um, group who Lam et al. They published a paper saying that this could either be a neutron star or a black hole. Um, I was a bit disappointed by this because uh, you know, the measurements were beautiful. And this, the lack of subtraction made it so bad. The, you know, so these are actually their models. The, this is a model for a neutron star and black hole. And none of the observed points actually, except the first and the last, of course, in straight line will pass through. And they do not pass through the uh, pass through the actual points. So to claim that we have detected a black hole or a neutron star with this model, very in any case, I won't go more into this. Uh, so it's uh, uh, but once you do the subtraction and all that, it's pretty clear. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, so, but you know, I was wondering whether we should publish, point out these uh, mistakes. But then uh, it's not nice. And if I say we are right, but that doesn't. Matter. So, but I was glad to see after that the Udalski's group, the Ambrose et al. Uh, they actually reanalyzed their Ogle data and found that what the the what we had derived for the, the angle that came out to be exactly what the photometry also showed. And if they take the revised uh, data into account, then uh, the mass is exactly consistent with what we uh, So that, that was nice. So this was one update, but another update I want to show here. So in the meantime, there have been uh, two more epochs of SST observations, uh, one from the LAM et al. they observed once, and then we uh, observed once, and those two observations uh, fit within uh, uncertainty the, the model that we have predicted. Uh, so they confirm the previous results. Of this. Okay, since we are running out of time, conclude now so by saying where this all is. So here, um, this is a um, artist's conception of the galaxy based on the VLBA observations of nature. If this we are uh, we are here we are on upper stack here uh, and we are looking down towards the galactic center towards the galactic bulge and this black hole is on the Carina Sagittarius arm the location of the uh, so this black hole happens to be in the Carina Sagittarius arm uh, uh, so. So to summarize, takes time. Uh, <laughs> so the astrometric microlensing is a powerful tool to determine the masses of isolated white dwarfs. We have measured the mass of two isolated white dwarfs, and these are consistent with the theory of degeneric matter. Uh, the HST monitoring of the long duration microlensing event, uh, Ogle 462, led to the first unambiguous detection of an isolated stellar mass black hole. The combination of photometry and astrometry gives the lens mass as 7.1 solar mass and distance is 1.6 kiloparsec. This is a, there is a bright star uh, 10 pixels away and its subtraction was crucial to this measurement. Its velocity is 45 kilometers per second with respect to the stars in that region, which suggests that it got a uh, kick at the time. Now I want to end by, you know, when, it, when we saw there was a lot of articles, one, uh, I want to just read one uh, little paragraph uh, from one of the articles. So one, Michelle Starr, a science journalist from Australia, he says, the black hole they found has a mass of about 7.1 times the mass of the sun. That would make its event horizon around 42 kilometers per second. Well, 42 kilometers. Uh, so the event horizon, the Schwarzschild radius is three kilometers per solar mass. So that means 21 kilometers per seven solar mass. So the diameter is, uh, is 42 kilometers. So that would make its event horizon just 42 kilometers per second, 26 miles across. 
take a moment to marvel at that. Scientists were able to detect an invisible object less than a tenth the length of the Grand Canyon from over 5,000 light years away by studying the changing light of a more distant star. That's freaking awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalash. Questions? Yes, Mike. So uh, back to the white dwarfs. You were focusing on the astrometric signal, but presumably there's also a magnification signal to measure in that case? Mm, no, no. So See, the astrometry falls as the inverse of the, uh, of the impact parameter, whereas the photometry falls as the fourth power of the uh, impact parameter uh, for larger impact parameter. So the photometry itself is the amplification is extremely small. Is uh, uh, James Webb looking at the position of this black hole in the infrared to see if they can see anything there? I wish. No. I, um, it would be interesting to see the, whether there is, uh, you know, yeah, but I think uh, it would be interesting to see in the infrared, in the uh, X-ray and in the radio as well. Um, I hope people will propose and hope it will be observed. Uh, but uh, yeah, it hasn't. Okay. So you show that this astrometric uh, Microlensing effect, uh, this effect is on order of about one milli arc second. Yeah. And this actually, uh, Gaia can do uh, astrometric precision sort of better than this or roughly uh, similar to this. So, do you think it's possible that Gaia can do its own astrometric uh, microlensing on its own? Or do you think follow up space telescope sort of observation is still necessary? So, in fact, the Gaia has already detected many microlensing effects. Of course, the astrometry, you know, the the individual epoch astrometry is not released yet, right? So, uh, so, but it would be hard to do that in the galactic bulge because the galactic bulge is so crowded that Gaia has a lot of problems in, in doing astrometry. Even HST, we had so much difficulty. Uh, but there are the entire sky is there. So, and there have been many such um, that have been observed. And I'm sure. Uh, yeah, we should keep an eye, and yes, when the uh, individual epoch estimately comes up, uh, try to see. Yeah. <laughs> what are the prospects for building up a larger sample of these events? So um, it takes time. I mean, it's a HST time. If uh, uh, you know, when we first proposed, it took me several. Uh, attempts to actually get approved because you are well, okay, but can you do it, you know? So, um, so they were very reluctant to give time. Um, but now that we actually have demonstrated, hopefully it would be a little easier. It takes about five, six orbits per, per target to six, at least six orbits per target. Um, so it's not a great investment of time, if, but it depends on how many, what is the success rate, we don't know. Um, if, uh, the future, we actually have already monitored about eight, uh, so perhaps we have detected one more, but uh, we're still working on it. Uh, but after this, depending on what the success rate would be, hopefully the tag would be more, One last question. Uh, let's thank Kalash Gannon and go to lunch.